All right. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. It is certainly a joy and a privilege. I think I better, I can button it, but I think I better leave it unbuttoned. It is a joy and a privilege uh, that we are here today, assembled to be able to share in our Bible study. Welcome to our Facebook campus. Welcome to our um, web, a website campus. Welcome to our YouTube campus. To those who view us uh, after this is broadcast, and for all of you who are part of our uh, virtual community, we say welcome to the Purity Virtual Bible Study. It's a delight to greet you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are uh, just excited uh, here on this Thursday. This Thursday afternoon at 1 o'clock, I appreciate you taking out the time in your day uh, to make these Thursdays work for you. Uh, even if you catch us at another time, whatever time you catch us, I appreciate you taking the opportunity to make it work for you. I'm grateful to uh, all of the members of Purity, to all of the persons who are part, again, of the virtual family, for those who are sharing, who are part of my own uh, biological family, who just tune in uh, just to hear uh, what the cousin or the nephew or uh, that one has to say. And I'm just grateful. Uh, I'm grateful for all, all that you do. I want to um, not take as, as much time as in, in uh, remarks as I normally do because I think the lesson may be just a little more involved uh, than we normally have. Uh, but I just want to uh, just want to offer my thanks. I say thank you to all of you who participated uh, in worship uh, on Sunday with us and shared with us as we celebrated uh, Father's Day and we celebrated Juneteenth. Um, certainly our Young People's Choir did a excellent and marvelous job in uh, sharing in a way that we could really be proud of. And uh, we look forward to academic recognition on this Sunday, academic recognition and youth Sunday. And uh, as I've said before, uh, you're welcome to join us. You can wear your regalia. You can wear it whether you're home or whether you're here with us. You're welcome to wear your regalia here or something that represents your school, uh, your school colors, or however you want to do it. Uh, you're welcome to do it, and we'd be glad to have you to worship with us uh, this Sunday as we celebrate academic recognition and our Youth Sunday. We want to highlight and enjoy all of our young people, and we want to celebrate each one of them for the gift that God has given us in each one of them. There is so much in our young people, so much value, so much worth, so much potential, and uh, we want to celebrate and highlight that and give them the opportunity to uh, to, to not only see uh, what they're doing, but also hear uh, what others are doing as well uh, as they grow and matriculate together. Uh, I am always enamored by the generations that are created uh, that make up each, you know, each generation of our young people in our church and, and then where they end up or where they, how they're matriculating and uh, those that are uh, still a part of our family and those that have gone to other places but still make a great impact and difference uh, because of the training that they receive right here at Puritan Baptist Church. We're delighted and we're grateful to God for that. I want to uh, lead us in prayer and then we're going to get right into our lesson for today. Again, thank you for joining us. Let us pray. Most holy, all wise, eternal God, our Father, we thank you for uh, you have brought us to this very present moment. God, we thank you for this time of study, this time of fellowship, this time of being together. We pray now, Father, that you would give us your strength, give us your guidance, give us your wisdom as we go through this Bible study. Help us to learn more about you. We want to be more like you, Jesus. As the hymn that we sang on Sunday said, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are, uh, we have been for uh, the last several weeks uh, in our Bible study uh, that is concerning the armor of God, putting on the whole armor of God. And um, this week, we are going to talk about the shield of faith. Uh, this fifth lesson in our series is the shield of faith. It's the fifth lesson, but it's the fourth piece, piece of armor. 
Uh, the fifth lesson is the shield of faith. And I'll read the scripture as I come to them in the lesson. I think that works for us better. The fourth piece of armor mentioned in Ephesians 6 is the shield of faith. How did Roman soldiers use their shields? What purpose does a spiritual shield serve for us? The Bible in Daniel chapter 3 records the story of the burning, fiery furnace. Three young men stood looking at the very site where they were going to be put to death. The edict had gone out. They were to be thrown alive and bound into a furnace, heated to seven times its usual fervor. Everyone watching understood this was an execution. This was what happened when you disobeyed the king. Just moments ago, the three men had been given the chance to circumvent this fate. With little more than a few motions on their part, they could have saved their own lives, but they refused. The question comes to us, why? Why did they not take the easy road and save their lives, so to speak? The king had previously set up a 90-foot high golden statue at various times throughout the day, which were prompted by music. He commanded that his people fall down and worship the statue. Out of the entire nation, we are given the names of only three men who had the courage to stand against this royal decree. Let me say that again. Out of the entire nation, only three men had the, the courage to stand against this royal decree. And for their courage, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were going to die. Isn't that something? Prior to us, prior to... To, to knowing what was going on at their time. We, we read the scripture so we know what happens. But in, in, in real time, they stood up, they were tall, they showed their courage, and their courage got them the fate of death. When King Nebuchadnezzar became aware of their insubordination, he summoned the rebels, gave them an ultimatum. Worship the statue or be thrown in the fiery furnace. Their response is preserved for us in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Again, that's Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. He will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which ye have set up. The faith of these three men in, in God allowed them to stand up to the world's most powerful man and refuse his blasphemous orders. They were then thrown into the fiery furnace, because that was the fate for their courage. And miraculously, delivered unharmed by God. Perhaps the most amazing thing about their story is their unwavering dedication to God in the face of an unknown outcome. Their faith was strong enough to accept giving their lives. The question then comes, how can we have that kind of faith? A faith that stands strong even with an unknown outcome, even with unsure circumstances. Up until now, Paul's description of the armor of God had been limited to items that we wear. We put on the belt. We put on the breastplate. We put on the shoes. And they essentially hold themselves up. But the shield is different. Paul tells us that the shield is something we must take up, something we are required to raise. Let me say that again. The shield is something we must take up, greater still, something that we are required to raise. Just strapping it to the arm won't do any good at all if we don't make the effort to hold it up and use it. 
how did the shield work in the Roman army? The Roman shield, the scutum, S-C-U-T-U-M, was not the standard medieval-esque shield most pictured in their minds upon hearing the word. It was instead a very large, slightly curved, rectangular shield featuring at its center a large metal knob called a boss. The scutum was an impressive line of defense because of its sheer size. Some were three and a half feet tall and almost three feet wide. Soldiers were afforded a great deal of protection from enemies. Because of its slight curve, it was able to deflect attacks without transferring the full force of the assault to the man holding the shield. Because of its boss, it was able to deflect even more vicious blows and function in a limited offensive capacity as a means of knocking an opponent backwards. The shield had multi-uses, multi-tasks. It could do many things. But again, it was something that had to be taken up, and even greater still, that was required to be raised. Let's talk about faith, because the shield is, is given faith, the shield of faith. So let's talk about faith, the faith that we must take up, the faith that we are required to raise, the faith that we can't just tie on our arms and think it's all good, but the faith that we've got we've to take it up, we've got to move it, we've got to raise it up so that we are active in it. Here, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Again, that's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, one of those scriptures that we know very well. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Here is the biblical definition of faith that clears up some common misconceptions. If faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, then this has far-reaching implications. Substance is tangible. Evidence is solid proof. Faith is, by definition, not some hazy emotion without any grounding in reality. However, faith is the irrefutable truth. Faith is real. Faith is bound in substance. It's tangible. Bound in the proof, solid proof. But you say to yourself, what's tangible? What's the proof? It is the fact that we understand who God is, that we trust in his nature, that we trust in God. That gives us what we stand in need of. Romans chapter 8, verses 24 through 25. Romans chapter 8, verses 24 through 25 say it this way. For we were saved in this hope. If Deacon Smith is watching, we are talking about hope even today. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is not seen is not hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. Let me say it again. For we are saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why do, does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Though it is based on solid evidence, that doesn't mean faith comes naturally or easily. Paul here makes an obvious but necessary point. You don't hope for what you already have. You already have it. You don't need to hope for it. Faith involves a huge element of trust. We must examine the evidence and see that God has proved himself to be unchanging and consistent. And then we must firmly believe that he will fulfill his promise to us. We must, let me say that again, examine the evidence and see that God has proven himself to be unchanging and consistent. And then we must firmly believe that he will fulfill his promise to us. Then we ask ourselves the question, where does living, saving faith come from? 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. To another faith by the same spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same spirit. That's a portion of that pericope. While we must believe God to even begin to walk with him, after repentance and baptism, he gives us a deeper, living, growing faith through his Holy Spirit. Why is the shield associated with faith, we may ask ourselves. Let's look at Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. A shield guards. While the physical shield protects us physically, faith can protect our spiritual lives even in the middle of physical trials. When Satan, through Nebuchadnezzar, attacked the values and beliefs of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were able to stand resolute and unwavering because of their faith. In their response, they essentially said, God is capable of delivering us from this faith. We don't know if he will or not, but it doesn't matter. He gives us his commands, and we're going to keep them regardless of the physical outcome. We know he can just as easily raise us from the dead. What a strong testimony. What a strong faith these boys had, these men had. A faith that said, no matter what, I know God can. Even if he doesn't choose to do it in this situation, he has the power to do it. That's strong faith. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, which will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. A shield deflects. Satan is always hurling his fiery darts of fear doubt and worry in our direction but the only time that they can hit us is when we let our shield of faith down when we stop believing that God is in control that he is working everything out for our good that whatever happens is for the ultimate best of everyone involved however little it seems to, to be that way when we don't operate our shield. Again, all the other items that we've talked about, you, you wear them, they, they hold themselves up. The shield, you've got to move. You've got to hold up. You've got to raise it. And that's the same thing with your faith. You've got to move it. You've got to raise it. You've got to keep it active. You've got to be, you've got to make sure that your shield is doing. And the only way that you can be penetrated by the darts of the wicked one, of Satan, the only way that his uh, plans, his tricks, his traps can hit you is if you let down your shield. Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 through 31. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the winds were boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? A shield is the first line of defense. While the rest of the armor helps protect us from Satan's onslaught, it is not what you ideally want to be using to absorb every hit. You do not, for instance, go into a battle intentionally blocking everything with your head. When our faith in God's omnipotence and care is strong, it is impossible for Satan to break through our shield and land and attack. But when we allow doubt to creep in, as Peter did when distracted by the waves, we will start to sink just like Peter. The rest of our armor will be battered, and so will we. 
but an actively raised shield of faith presents prevents this otherwise debilitating and inhibiting fatigue. When we keep our faith raised, when we keep that shield high, we don't find ourselves in the place where we will sink to depths that we know we're better than. Matthew chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. Matthew chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You will worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. A shield can incapacitate. When Christ was being tempted by Satan, his faith in the word and the commands of God repelled Satan for a time. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 tells us that Christ was tempted in all things. So this was certainly not the only encounter Christ had with the devil. The boss, the metal knob in the middle on the Roman shield, allows soldiers to give their enemies a stun-inducing shove that would allow them to follow through with an attack. Our faith in God, as demonstrated by Christ, can also give Satan a good shove backwards and give us a chance to fight back by doing God's will and his work. You see that shield is created uh, to protect you, but it can also give a shove forward. That boss on there can push the devil back just enough. So that, so that you can, you can fight. You can fight with God's word. You can fight with doing God's will. You can fight with doing God's work. And listen, doing God's work draws you closer to Him. Yeah, when you get out and serve and, and work and, 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 and help and do other things, that is just as much faith building as you reading your scripture. Now I'm not saying it should, it should be in place of, but what I'm saying is, you, you read the Bible, you do God's will, but you also do the work of the kingdom. And those things help to raise that shield even higher. Because God tells us that faith cannot be just in our minds, but it must produce actions, works of obedience and suffering. How else can the shield be used? The Roman military had an inventive and a very effective tactic that made use of their large shields. When enemies became, would begin firing arrows and other projectiles at the army, the soldiers would close rank into a rectangular array called the testudo or tortoise formation. And those on the outside would use their shields to create a wall around the perimeter. Then those in the middle would raise their shields over their heads to protect everyone from airborne missiles. The result was a formidable human tank that could be stopped only through a tremendous effort. Isn't that something when we put all our faith together, when we put all our shields together, we get some on the outside and they build the perimeter. You get some in the center that lift their shields above their head. And, 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 and I'm telling you, even if they try to get in, it's going to take a lot to get in because those shields are, 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 are not just one individual, but now they're together. Now our faith is together. And so, and so faith, when it is communal, becomes even more power. One can do one thing, but then when you get two or three together, you've got, a, you've got an even greater difference. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the Oh, to perfect man, I'm sorry, to perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into, into him who is the head, Christ, for whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. When the Roman army joined its shields together, it became an almost unstoppable force. And we in God's church join our shields. That is, strengthen each other with our faith building up and serving within the body as we are able, we will become an unstoppable force, able to take on any challenge. We must remember, as we fight, that this is not simply our battle. This is the battle of all of our brethren, both near and far. The battle of all of our brothers and sisters. The battle of all of us. And if we are to win, it will be only be once we put our faith in God and stand side by side, contending earnestly as one for our common salvation, the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude verse 3. We've got to see our faith as individual. We've also got to see our faith as communal that when we unite our faith, we can do much more together than ever we were able to do apart. We thank God for that kind of faith. Listen, thank you for your support. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you being here, sharing with us in our Thursday afternoon Bible study. Yes, I could have gone longer. Yes, it was just getting good. We committed to those 30 minutes and we're going to stick with them. I pray that you will have a wonderful day and that you will continue to build and raise your faith, raise your sheep, so that nothing that tries to penetrate you will ever be able to get in and cause you to sink to places that you know you're better than. Let us pray. Most holy God, our Father, we thank you. We honor you. We glorify you. We ask now that you would strengthen us. Give us your peace and your power. Help us to fight the battles that are ahead of us with the armor that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God be with you all. And thank you again for your time and your support. Have a wonderful afternoon.